seltzer is awesome. So awesome. Yep, that's that's enough to start the stream. So hey guys, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Again, I'm Jordan Pacheco. This is the Glad Trad Podcast, and we are doing our Friday stream. It's Friday the 13th. Ooh, spooky. But uh we're gonna start doing these hopefully every week or at least whenever I can. So if that's a good idea, I did vote or uh put out a poll in chat. Uh, earlier this week and it seemed like the majority of you would enjoy kind of a friday stream and some of you were asking if this would also be available after a stream goes down and the answer is yes so if you have to dip out and do something or if you kind of miss the feed i wanted to use these friday streams to kind of talk about stuff i'd seen throughout the week to really interact with you guys as the followers the listeners and the viewers and also just to kind of let our hair down and talk really just for an hour and kind of chill, right? So I hope you have your nightcap. Um, maybe you have your Mayflower cigar or something like that. So chill, you know, it's going to be an absolutely great show today. And the first thing I wanted to talk about was someone who I don't really talk about a lot because we don't really do a lot of apologetics on this show. There are a couple of videos that we have done, but I wanted to talk about Redeemed Zoomer, who is a pretty big Protestant... Uh, apologetics kind of guy. He has a very healthy YouTube channel and um, the, the name is kind of in it. He's a, clearly a Protestant, but he really wants to fight for mainline Protestantism. Um, when I say healthy channel, I mean, his channel alone has over 450,000 subscribers and um, he's part of the Presbyterian Church USA, uh, but I'm going to read his description here on his YouTube. He's Part of the Presbyterian Church USA, I'm so sorry that you're a Presbyterian to deem Zoomer, but I completely oppose the theological liberalism and progressivism that has hijacked it. I make it my mission to restore it. So essentially, he's just a guy who has seen in mainline Protestant denominations in particular the decay intellectually, theologically, and so he spends a lot of his uh, his work talking about the Protestant Reformation, talking about apologetics from a Protestant perspective, um, and of course, really going after mostly the kind of theologically liberal things. Sometimes he brushes up against Catholics and knowing how Catholics work, we like to brush up against uh, him. But for the most part, it's kind of like uh, if um, Ready to Harvest decided to probably take a stand and help really restore the mainland denominations. By the way, you should check out Redeem Zoomer's work. It's great work. And you should check out Ready to Harvest, who I like a lot. He does these sort of unbiased overviews of denominations on his channel. And it's, it's really, really cool. Uh, so I don't want to talk about Redeemed Zoomer. Are we starting beef? <laughs> no. no, no, nothing like that. And I don't know him and I'm not trying to put up on his radar. But something very interesting did happen today. And um, that is that Redeemed Zoomer is quitting apologetics. So he's staying Protestant as far as we can tell. And particularly Presbyterian Protestant. I'm so sorry, my guy. But uh, he is quitting uh, apologetics. I want to read from his Twitter feed. Maybe I can... Uh, I could share my screen if I wanted to, but I'll just kind of read this because it's really fine. You guys can read this on his Twitter feed, but I'll start down a little bit. Well, I'll start with the main one, right? So Redeem Zoomer um, looks like yesterday, rather, um, says, I'm giving up Protestant apologetics. I'm not giving up on Protestantism. I'm just not the best person to defend it. I'm going to focus my energy on fighting liberalism within Protestantism. And then he gives kind of a list of peoples to follow. Um, and there are a couple other things that he has. I want to read a couple more of his tweets from September 12th. He has this one that's interesting here, and we'll talk about this, which is why I want to talk about him. Uh, he says, Protestant answer, Protestants answer this. Why did virtually every historic Protestant institution get hijacked by liberalism and Catholic, Eastern, and Oriental Orthodox ones didn't? Why didn't we have to rebuild? Or why, rather, why do we have to rebuild and they don't? If the mainline Protest or mainline denominations are not retaken, Protestantism will fizzle out into decentralized non-denominationalism and Pentecostalism. And then there's another tweet that he has here, and I'll kind of go through all these again as we sort of talk. But he says, to conservatives, the conservatives say, this institution said something that offends me, time to leave. And the progressives say, this institution said something that offends me, time to change. This is why conservatives always lose always. That is a separate issue, but that's something that I think we actually have a lot of common ground on. We can talk about it in a little bit. Um, first off, whew, I don't know anybody in my personal life who's a really serious mainline Protestant. I know a lot of evangelicals and maybe even a couple Pentecostals, but really mostly evangelicals. 
Um, I don't know of anybody kind of our age who is a, a serious Methodist or Presbyterian. And they're, they're the seven sisters, right, of the American church. I don't have them all listed off, but obviously these are the mainline Protestant denominations, uh, the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians, the Methodists. Um, and they have been trending theologically liberal for really a century and beyond in particular. And specifically, I would say in the last 40, 50 years, as far as I can tell when I watch a video on Ready to Harvest, I mean, they've just completely hollowed themselves out with a lot of what I think is common grounds with us Catholics. So kind of seeing the interwar in Protestantism is not really something to celebrate crazy, my friends, brothers and sisters. And the reason why is because it's sad that religiosity in general in this nation is going down. Yes, as, as a traditional Catholic, and of course we'll talk about the Pope's comments a little later, um, but as a traditional Catholic, I want everybody, Protestant and non-Protestant, non-Christians, anybody to come to the fullness of the truth. I really uh, hold that because God holds that to be the fullness of the Catholic faith. And inside the Catholic religion, I highly recommend that we really hold fast to the traditions which we have been taught, as St. Paul talks about, right? Whether it's by written word or oral tongue that we we know that these are the metrics, that the sacraments are the ordinary means of salvation on the world. And it is really unfortunate that there are a lot of people, I know this, that there are Protestants who, who do love Jesus or are trying to follow after the Lord, but they obviously don't live a life of sacramental grace. Some Protestants who I know who are, I would say, are very devout in their desire to follow the Lord, um, they haven't even been baptized. That's not even a necessity for their tradition. And that's very alarming as a Protestant. So, yeah, I know that sometimes it's fun to dunk on the prots, right, especially the mainland denominations, because they have things like um, like transgender priesthoods and and gay marriage and the the you don't have to really even believe in anything to still hold to some of these denominations. You think of, um, say, like the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which is just absolutely off the deep end or the Episcopalian Church. Right. Or the United Church of Christ, which is you don't even have to be a Christian to be part of that denomination anymore. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Um, so I can understand why for someone like Redeem Zoomer that it might be more fruitful to talk about the sort of things inside Protestantism and the sort of restoration inside mainline Protestantism. Now, he did say something in his tweet here that I do want to just talk about. He says, Protestants answer this. Why did virtually every historic Protestant institution get hijacked by liberalism and Catholic Eastern and Oriental Orthodox ones didn't? Why do we have to rebuild and they don't? I actually would say this, rede redeemed Zoomer. Um, Catholics, especially as traditional Catholics, there's a lot of that sentiment that we feel as well, that our institutions, our organizations, how we did things, how we professed our Catholic religion, that much of it did in fact fall to liberalism and to secular modernism, and that we feel this even up to the papacy as we have an issue of pluralism, the heresy of pluralism uh, that, that Pope Francis has 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 gone close to. I'm not going to say he's, he's committed heresy or anything because I'm not going to judge the Holy Father. I'm just saying that, that there are other theologians and other minds, and we'll read those in a little bit, who, um, who have also raised those concerns, especially about today. But the difference, I, I would say, is... For you, redeemed Zoomer, does being a Presbyterian, is that necessary for salvation? So Catholics might say that extra ecclesia no lus salus, right? That the church is not just a communion, an invisible body made up of a communion of believers, but the church also has a, a divine structure to it that starts in heaven in the church triumphant that goes through the souls uh, in purgatory, the state of purgatory, the church suffering, and of course extends us down to us on earth still, the church militant, and that the Pope is the vicar of Christ. He's, he is uh, not the head of the church. That would be, of course, Christ himself, but he is a representative of the embodiment of, of the unity of the Catholic church on earth, right? Whoever occupies the chair of Peter. So for Catholics, we do echo Peter in John 6, right? We remember in verse 66, brothers and sisters, right, um, Peter leaves and, or not Peter, I'm sorry, the whole of the following about Jesus concerning the bread of life discord leaves. And uh, our Lord turns to the apostles, turns to Peter and says, do you also wish to leave? To which Peter replies, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So even as trad Catholics, as we've watched the Latin mass, sacramentals, devotions like the rosary, traditional forms of piety, 
uh, a proper understanding of Christian marriage, as we watch those things rip away at confirmation, oh my gosh, as we watch those things rip away and diminish, the thing is that where else are we going to go? These are the words of eternal life. Catholics believe that the sacraments are the ordinary means of grace that God, through the church, pours upon the world. They believe that it is through a life of sacramental grace, through a life of conforming ourselves to Christ, to loving God and loving our neighbor, that we achieve salvation. To the outside of the Catholic Church, while there is invincible ignorance, that is not some exception to the rule. It just means that God will take everything into account. But the best means of salvation, the one that we're guaranteed, of course, is that we must live a life of our baptismal promises. That if we we cooperate with God's grace, if we have a reception of the sacraments, the Eucharist, baptism, if we confess our sins, right? If we do these things, we do them with love, with charity in our hearts, that we will see the face of God, right? This is why Catholics have great hope in the resurrection. We're an Easter people, as we've all heard. So the reason I bring this up is because Presbyterianism um, is an offshoot of of Protestantism, an offshoot of Anglicanism, if I remember correctly. And I don't know if being a Presbyterian in and of itself is salvific. Now, you may love your tradition. You may you may want to to re- revive the pre- uh, the Presbyterian Church, and that's you know I I think I'd rather have a more theologically conservative Presbyterian Church than a theologically liberal one because people need religiosity, even if they're not Catholics. The the lack of religiosity, friends, is has been very very damaging to this country. Um, but I would say that if it's not necessary to be a Presbyterian, what does it matter if a man isn't evangelical or Methodist or a Lutheran or an Episcopalian? What are those core of the Bible? What is that core that even mainline denominations agree upon that are the things that are actually necessary for salvation? If it's not the Catholic Church, if it's not, you know, cooperating with God's grace that way, well, it's the only way, of course, but uh, if it's not, what are those things that are necessary? Why is the Presbyterian Church of America, why is it worth saving? Catholics would say that we would save the Catholic Church. Well, we cooperate with God's grace, because, but we would say that the church is the bride of Christ, and we have an obligation to make sure that the bride of Christ can stay as spotless as possible. And we fail many times because we are all sinners, right? All of us fall short of the glory of God. But that is why I'm a Catholic, even with the scandal, with what the Pope says, because the Pope is not Christ, right? And your bishop isn't Christ, but, and we are called to be Christ, but just because uh, one of the hierarchy or one of the lady is doing something evil doesn't mean the whole organization is kaput. In the Catholic Church, we teach that formally the Catholic Church is protected from teaching error, right? This is what, um, this is the protection of the Petrine office. This is the protection when there is a, a dogmatic decree of papal infallibility that these things are immune from error. So you can have a pope who is living a life of a wicked, most wicked people. I have a whole book of popes about that. Um, but that the church in and of herself cannot teach error. That is a really, really high bar for Catholics to hold. And sometimes we get very nervous, I know, fellow papists, but it's true. This is what God established for us. So I would just say to Regime Zoomer that I actually understand the sympathy, I don't, uh, the, the sentiment, I don't think as Catholics it would be very good just to attack and say, well, next you got to convert, which you should, right? You should, if you're finding that Protestantism is not fulfilling, um, you should come and fight for the one true church. Of course, I would say that. But also, I very much uh, understand your sentiment. And I also see what you said here. If the mainline denominations are not retaken, Protestantism will fizzle out into decentralized non-denominationalism and Pentecostalism. The only thing I can say, dude, is that it from the inception was already decentralized and non-denominationalism still started reigning as soon as Luther nailed those 95 theses to the door. Where is the authority in Protestantism, friends? And it doesn't mean like, oh, everything the Pope does, we cheer, we go, oh, good, you know, we're going to win because we have the Pope. (laughs) As As we've seen today, that can sometimes be very difficult. But of course all denominations were going to break down into decentralized non-denominationalism and Pentecostalism because uh, there is no structure. And I would actually say that one of the things about being a Catholic that is amazing is despite the best efforts, whether it's Pope Francis or John the 12th or myself, despite our best efforts as sinners, we don't, uh, the church uh, will always prevail, right? We hear in Matthew, uh, the gates of hell will not prevail. And so there have been some doozies in the church's history. So I would say that for any Protestant who might come across this, 
for anyone who might be really hurting in the denomination, they find them adrift, they don't know where to go, come home. Your, your heritage, what God has given to you, is home in the Catholic Church. And as Catholics, we need to be very welcoming and very kind and also very clear with our Protestant brothers and sisters because that sort of charity is true. Um, one of my favorite phrases I like to say, friends, is truth without love is cruelty, and love without truth is also cruelty. So just to drop, convert, or go to hell, and then leave without a relationship is cruelty. Because people are just confused and they get angry, and actually, you end up hurting the body of Christ, right? We, we damage what Catholicism looks like because there's no love there. But equally, to say, oh, you know, as Pope Francis, I think, has, has certainly hinted at today, you can be anything and it's all a path to God. Pluralism is great. No, that's cruelty as well. Because now you are robbing people of the truth which will satisfy their souls. And that's not, that's not good either. So you should pray. Uh, I'll, I'll keep you in my prayers, redeemed Zoomer. I know that that's very, very difficult. Uh, he just says, again, I'm not giving up on Protestantism. I'm just giving up on Protestant apologetics. So he's not going to be fighting with the Orthodox or the Catholics anymore. Totally cool, man. I mean, we have our own fish to fry, too. I don't really see a lot of benefit in trading jabs or sniping or even like the big Protestant debates right now. I mean, we're just kind of picking everything up. Um, in his last tweet he made three hours ago, guys, I'll still be making videos. Just no more anti-Catholic or anti-Orthodox videos. Catholics can worry about Catholic problems and I'll worry about Protestant problems. Well, <laughs> I think uh, that is totally cool. But I do hope, I mean, I see that you are a Calvinist, oh Lord. But uh, I do hope that if you are searching for the truth, that you will find the fullness of it. And if you are really searching for it, then uh, I hope that this is a, a wake-up call to maybe consider beyond the internet really consider the claims and truths of the Catholic faith. I do want to recommend if Zoomer or if anyone who's a Protestant, maybe from the Presbyterian tradition, is ever listening, um, I do want to point out a book that uh, everyone should read, and it's called Rome Sweet Home by Scott Hahn. Scott Hahn was a former Pentecostal pastor, actually, and he converted to the Catholic faith, essentially by kicking and screaming, being dragged in. Him and his wife were there throughout a lot of the decline in Pentecostalism, a lot of the theological liberalism, really triumphing. And it's a great book. So again, that's called Rome Sweet Home. It's a wonderful book. And uh, if I ever talk to Zoomer, I'd happily send him a copy indeed. And as Candace Owen says, that's all I'm going to say about that. Looking at the chat. Hello, guys. Uh, Des, I'm glad that you liked it as well. Great book. Hey, Diane. Uh, shoot, just noticed now. Hey, man. Oh, uh, lady, madam. <laughs> hey, totally cool. Uh, thank you for tuning in very much. Don't forget to like the stream. Get more people uh, understanding that we are doing this every Friday, or at least as many Fridays as we can. So don't worry whatsoever if you're coming in a little bit late. Let's talk about something else, friends. Let's talk about a really big thing, and that is what Pope Francis said uh, out there in, where was he? Some, some uh, Asianic country. It'll come to me. I'll have to pull up the article real quick and take a sip of uh, cider. Just kidding. It's just seltzer. So my buddy, the traditional Thomist, had a great, great video today and a couple of videos. He was on, I know, with Timothy Flanders earlier about this topic, and he also made his own video. Totally check it out. I'll try to link it if I can. Um, just an awesome, awesome video, and support with him is great, but I want to read what our good buddy Nick Cavazos wrote about these statements, and you should check out the video, and if you're a, a first source kind of person, I think it's very important, especially when it comes to statements of the Holy Father, which means that you should check it out yourself, right? So find the article or maybe the original clip or, or wherever it originally came from, and just read his comments in context, because I the last thing I'd want to do is, uh, is unfortunately besmirch or get worked up over something the Holy Father said, if that's not what he said. It seems like this is, and I'm gonna read the kind of comments and maybe some stuff that Nick uh, said about it, but I don't want this, you know, this channel is not a dogpile on the Pope. Obviously, we've been able to have very serious conversations about Pope Francis. I had Patrick Coffin on my show months ago to ask a very simple question, which is that Patrick, who's been very instrumental in a lot of my faith when it came to uh, the Catholic Answers kind of stuff, um, he doesn't hold that Pope Francis is a pope. He thinks he's an anti-pope. I wanted to know why, right? So even while I think I hold that Pope Francis is pope, I actually historically realize that it's it's not as... It's more important to acknowledge that there 
there should be a man on the chair of St. Peter and that that is what the Catholic faith is, then maybe the particulars of sometimes in history when we don't quite know who the Pope is. So I'm trying to be as charitable as possible there and just say that instead of fighting about the legitimacy or illegitimacy of Pope Francis, I think the important thing is just the understanding that the Petrine office has been given uh, to the world. And I, I think that it's important to acknowledge Pope Francis as, of course, um, the Roman pontiff, but I'm not going to beat you up if that's been something you've been really dealing with. I know that I've had listeners and viewers uh, and subscribers who've really wrestled with this sometimes, especially when the Pope says stuff like we're about to read now. Um, but again, yeah, check out Nick's video. Great. I'll try to link it in the chat in just a second. But I wanted to read some of the statements and then also what Nick has written. And why am I going to Nick and, and no one else? Because I think Nick, A, being kind of of the same age range, it's easy just to kind of under, his language is easier to digest. And also he's a good friend of mine. And Nick, coming from his Protestant background, Calvinist background, redeem Zoomer, uh, <laughs> Nick also is the guy who's just very hungry for the truth. He, want, he is studying to be a theologian. I think he's going to go places. I highly suggest that when Pius XIII or Leo XIV take their thrones, that they, uh, they run all their statements by Nick. I'm sure that that's going to be great. So here's the first statement that Pope Francis said. All religions are paths to reach God. They are, to make a comparison, like different languages, different dialects, to get there. But God is God for everyone. And I'm now going to read what Nick wrote. Nick says that the censor here is approximate to heresy. The statement implies that all religions are valid paths to God. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. This isn't Nick's words. Um, these are theological censors. Um, I think that's accurate to say. Nick, if you're in the chat, you let me know. I guess you might be saying what you're calling out. But uh, the point being is that this is what it says. It says, this statement implies that all religions are valid paths to God, which aligns with religious indifferentism. The church has consistently condemned this error. Pope Pius IX in his encyclical A Quanta Cura from 1864 specifically rejected religious indifferentism, stating that it is a grave error to claim that the way in which each person follows his own religion with the hope of eternal salvation is good and praiseworthy. Furthermore, Pope Gregory XVI's encyclical Mirari Vos in 1832, it is condemned as an erroneous belief to hold that it is possible to arrive at eternal salvation by any profession of faith, provided that morals are kept intact. This teaching directly contradicts the idea that all religions are simply different languages that lead to God. I mean, uh, those two popes said it better than I certainly could. Uh, there we go. Hey, Nick, how's it going? I, I'm sure quite a day news not to talk about. There are my words I apply. Okay, got it, brother. Hey, thanks for also thanks for tuning in, man. That's great. Hey, if you want to link your video in the chat for me, that would be awesome because I think a lot of people should look at it and Obviously, I think you're great, and I hope we stay friends forever and don't have a falling out like Taylor Marshall and Timothy Gordon did. Okay, just playing. So, uh, again, what these popes have written, I, I, I mean, it's it's obviously true. I don't. <laughs> the Society of Pope Pius X also took this umbrage with some of the writings of the Second Vatican Council, which seemed to suggest that there was this religious indifferentism that was rising. And personally, in my own life, I think up until high school, when we got a Polish priest who really meant the fire of the faith. I didn't really understand extra ecclesia no salus. I didn't quite understand that to be a Catholic was not just the privileged way. It was the way, the truth, and the life, right? This is what our Lord, our Lord has some very radical words in scripture. I am, the, look at what he says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. So is it possible that there are Muslims or pagans or, or somebody in heaven? The answer is all things are possible in God's grace. I do like the fact that Dante placed um, unbaptized babies and also righteous pagans. That was Dante's words. He placed them in limbo. And if you subscribe to the belief in limbo, the belief is that on the last day, the souls in limbo will, will go to heaven. I'm not really the biggest limbo believer per se, but I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm just, it's fine. That's not my point. My point being is that, um, yeah, anything's possible in God's mercy. Obviously, God, however, has given us the sacraments as the ordinary means of salvation. And God has given us the church outside which there's no salvation. So if any man is to be saved, right, invincibly ignorance, which is not like a technicality, guys. It's something you probably shouldn't lean on. You know what I'm saying? But if any man is to be saved, it's not because he was a good Muslim. It's not because he was a good Jew. It's not because he was a good Protestant. It's not because he was a good Sikh. The reasons he's saved has to be because of, of the virtues of, of the, the graces of the church, 
that have been working through his life. And also legitimate invincible ignorance. God, what does it say in the book of wisdom, right? God did not make death, nor does he delight in the destruction of the living. But Catholics, this is why we have an obligation to convert our, our fellow man. If we truly love our neighbor as ourselves, we want them to come to the fullness of the truth. And it's not by gloating. It's not because, oh, we're better than everybody else. Uh, <laughs> I see, Nick. I will convince you of limbo. Listen, totally, I, I'm <laughs> not trying to... My mom believes in it. It's cool, man. I'm, I'm open, right? I, I get it. I get it. And, you know, I'm, I'm a bad trad. That's what I've learned over the past year. I'm just a bad trad. <laughs> but the point being is like, yes, no. Islam, which first off, I reject even as an Abrahamic faith. Yes, like they're by blood related to Abraham. But by inception, I'm with uh, Robert um, Spencer on this one, that it grew out of a strange monogamation of uh, Arianism and uh, Islamic or uh, Arabic paganism, uh, very bestial religions of the area. Um, Allah doesn't exist. The thousands upon thousands of gods of Hinduism don't exist. Zeus doesn't exist. Our Lord Jesus Christ exists. The Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit exist, have always existed, and will always exist. And there was nothing, they are existence itself. Like they birthed, or not birthed, but being, that being which being is formed, therefore. And that's important because the Holy Father, as vicar of Christ, he has an obligation to shepherd the souls of the faithful and also the obligation to preach the truth. We are all going to be judged by those times where we could have, through the grace of charity, been good to our neighbors and, and shared with them the grace of Christ. And it's unfortunate that people may walk away from this statement and think, oh, I'm just going to keep being a Muslim. I'm just going to keep, I'm just going to keep being agnostic, but kind of just being a good person. This is, this is honestly funny for all of Catholicism. We've been accused of being a people who believe in a gospel of works. We're saved just by works. We're not saved by faith. Catholics are both and religion. We are saved by, by faith and works, and we're not saved by faith alone. But when you have a comment like this, I think that that's exactly what it taps into. The accusation proves itself legitimate. If really all religions are different dialects, they're different languages to get there, but God is God for everyone, which is true. God is God, yes, for everyone, but you have to acknowledge him as God and you have to not only acknowledge God, you have to therefore conform your life to what God has given the world, which is his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and through our Lord Jesus Christ, the church. And anything outside of that, guys, it's not worth it. It's not worth the theological confusion and ignorance to live that way. So terribly unfortunate there. Going to read the second statement here. Uh, by the way, if, get your comments in, by the way. I love the interaction. love the engagement. Stream is looking really healthy. Great views. So we're, we're doing all right. Um, statement two here. If you start to fight saying, my religion is more important than yours, mine is true and yours isn't, where will this lead us? Um, more souls, God willing, going to heaven. So I want to read the Aaron theology. The censor says Aaron theology. This statement diminishes the importance of proclaiming the Catholic faith as the one true religion. The church has always maintained that it alone contains the fullness of truth. And this must be asserted clearly. Pope Pius XI in his encyclical uh, Mortalium Animus, 1928, warned against Irenicism. The idea that one should downplay doctrinal differences in favor of unity. It is clear that no, uh, no other is constituted in any, uh, in any way over the Church of Christ except that which was founded by Christ himself, namely the Roman Catholic Church. The concern here is that the statement discourages defending the truth of Catholicism and prioritizes peace over the proclamation of true doctrine, a position that has been rejected historically. It's also like it's been rejected historically. Also, it's just never worked. Like <laughs> if we Catholics would put down the sword early and just for the sake of peace and did everything that way, we'd be all speaking Arabic right now. We just celebrated the anniversary of the Battle of Vienna where uh, King Jan Sobrisk, so Sobieski of the Polish, uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at the time, um, it was him and his winged hussars who liberated the, 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 uh, the city of Vienna from the Ottoman Empire. And that wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, cordial interreligious dialogue. That was because fundamentally, as people of the book in Islam, we have, there's only three options for a Christian in regards to Islam. You convert, you pay the jizya, a tax, which says you pay us tribute, we'll leave you alone, or it's put to the sword. 
And that's what time, space, and history has done. So this whole conforming to the world, I mean, did not our Lord tell us to be in the world, but not to be of the world? So I don't understand how we can, on one hand, say that the Catholic faith is true and beautiful and everyone should come in the water is great, and then completely not help our fellow men learn the fullness of the truth. It doesn't mean we have to be jerks. I don't think online is probably the best venue for most of us. Most of us have friends in our close lives, people who would be receptive to the faith and we just haven't been bold enough to share it. That's all, that is all God is asking you to do. Okay, he's not asking you to get into a fight with redeemed Zoomer. He's not asking you to, to go put anybody to the sword. Obviously not, that's not Christian. He's asking us instead to love our, our God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your, your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. You shall love the neighbor, your neighbor as yourself. So if I love myself, I want the fullness of the truth, which is why I, I would be a Catholic. And that's why we should share the gospel with our friends. Terribly unfortunate uh, from the Holy Father. Where will that lead us? Well, it doesn't mean we have to kill each other, but it does mean that we need to be bold. And I do think that this is one of the things about traditional Catholicism that has very much attracted me. It's the faith is... is put forth as true. Not just one of many, it's put forth as true. Those seeds for me were planted even before I went to Latin Mass. There were a couple of priests who are very good about giving that to my high school self, um, but that was good. Got to read the comments here. Hey, Epa Rose, good to see you here. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's so loud. Oh, I'm sorry that was so loud. Uh, Father McTague talked about that battle today, how the Polish soldiers went into battle singing a hymn to Mary. This is a very Catholic thing, and I think especially as, as traditional Catholics and certainly as men, there's something about charging into battle with an Ave Maria. I've always thought if I am ever martyred, which God willing, I won't be um, because I'm not strong enough. But if I ever was, what my last words would be, I like to think it would be singing the Salve Regina or the Ave Maria. I know I'd make a really dank comment that you can't put on a prayer card, like your mom joke and they'd be like, okay, Jordan, no, no, no we can't do that. Sorry. Uh, Nick says, Surah 929 puts the end uh, to ecumenical dialogue. They tell us to coexist, except the C is always trying to kill the other letters. Yo, that's totally true. Surah, by the way, is in the Quran for those who, who don't know. Um, let's see. Is anyone else getting a lot of pro-abortion ads on the Catholic YouTubes? Thanks, Diana. Hopefully that is not the case. I'm going to keep reading here. So this is, and again, the point of bringing this up is not just to make a, a Pope hating, Pope bashing thing. I want Pope Francis to be a good spiritual father. I think we need that as trads. I, I think we've, we have felt pretty abused and neglected because we just want everyone to be in the fullness of the faith. If Pope Francis came out and said a base statement tomorrow, we wouldn't be like, oh, well, you know, he, he's just trying to appease. We'd be like, oh, thank God, that's great. I hope he continues it, right? If Pope Francis came up and just apologized for <laughs> fiducia supplicans and tricias custodes, I'd be like, hey, the water is great, no problem. That's, that's what Christians are supposed to do, right? So here's statement number three. I'd say that this one is pretty big, and you can tell because Nick wrote a couple paragraphs for this. But statement three, there is only one God, and each of us has a language to arrive at God. Some are Sikh, Muslim, Hindu, Christian. There are they are different ways to God. This is like this is huge. Now, I wish that it was so generic and that it was like there's only one God and each of us has a language to pray to God in. And he was like, some of us are Polish and some of us are African. Some of us are Japanese, but we can all pray to God in, in the languages we've been given. That would be that would be the, the good statement. But that's not it, because he's talking specifically about religion. Some are Sikh, Muslim, Hindu, Christian. They are different ways to God. Do you not know the scriptures? I am the way again, this is. This for me is one of the most controversial things Jesus said, because this is like an all in the line thing, right? Either the man who's saying this is God, or this is the greatest case of blasphemy the world's ever seen. Imagine if your friend turned to you and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. You'd be like, what? You couldn't even comprehend that. That's what our Lord said. And our Lord has the authority to say so because he's God for heaven's sake. And so that's terribly, terribly, terribly unfortunate for, uh, for the Holy Father to say. I'm gonna read what Nick wrote here. Um, based as always, dear Nicholas, he says, this censor is proximate to heresy. While it is true that there is one God, the idea that all religions are valid ways to God contradicts church teaching. Pope Pius IX in the Syllabus of Errors, 1864, condemned the proposition that man is free to embrace and profess that religion which, guided by the light of reason, he shall consider true. 
The church teaches that there is only one path to God, which is through Christ and his church. Yes, exactly. And Pope Leo XIII, he's my boy, by the way. I mean, his cultists, you should all totally pray for his canonization. In Pope Leo XIII's encyclical Immortale Dei, 1885, the church is affirmed as the only true religion. It is impossible that the most true God, who is truth itself, the best and wisest provider, and the ruler of all things, approve all sects which profess false teachings, differing from one another and contradicting one another. The concept that, and this is Nick's words now, the concept that Muslims, Hindus, and Christians all have valid languages or paths to God undermines the exclusive claim of the Catholic Church as the Ark of Salvation. Absolutely right. In fact, the Catholic Church, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the, the titles is a sacrament of salvation, which always sounded funny to me when I first heard it, because it's hard when you're learning your seven sacraments, and you're like, oh, is there an eighth one? Um, so I'm very glad they point out. Yes, indeed. Either the Catholic Church is the one true church, or it's once among many. We talked about redeemed Zoomer earlier. The question I would put forth to him is the Presbyterian Church necessary? Do you must you be a Presbyterian to be saved? Right? Must you be a Presbyterian to go to heaven? And if the answer is no, and not by some invincible ignorance thing, if the answer is no, you can have a good Methodist who goes to heaven and all the same styling, even if the tradition is different, then then I'm not interested. Of conclusion, the key problem with these statements is their tendency towards religious indifferentism, which has been consistently condemned by the pre-Vatican II Church. The idea that all religions are merely different paths to God contradicts the clear teaching of the Catholic Church as the one true faith through which salvation is offered. These assessments rest on the documents like Pope Gregory XVI's, I see, so he goes through kind of his sources again. All of these documents which you've talked about just before, friends, all these firmly reject the notion that other religions offer legitimate ways to salvation and affirm the necessity of the Catholic Church. Couldn't have said it better myself because I don't have a theologian's mind, Nick. So I'm very happy that you put that up. Again, everyone should definitely check out Nick's video. It's awesome. If it's not going to rob you of your inner peace. Um, but again, what I said, truth without love is cruelty. And love without truth is also cruelty. And I think that Pope Francis oftentimes uh, portrays the latter of that statement. I, I think that there is a love for fellow men, even men that are different than us, and we should have that as, as Catholics, right? Our Lord says for us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. But if we do not share with them the joy of the gospel message, if we do not share with them the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, if we do not share with them a life of sacramental grace and of virtue and, and of the world healed through Christ and his sacrifice, then it's cruelty. And we'll be judged for that, friends. We will be judged by how all those statements we've made to people to tell them that it's not that big of a deal. Oh, yeah, you know, get married outside the church. It's not that big of a deal. Oh, yeah, you know, go, you know, ex-Catholics, go to whatever church you want. It's not that big of a deal. Now, I'll be honest. I The, the more I've kind of gone into my own faith, the more I, I'm aware that the Holy Spirit works in his own time and we have an obligation to pray and to help that along. But sometimes that's okay. Like, I, would I rather someone have some religion than no religion? It certainly is a little easier to talk about it. Um, I'd rather everyone be Catholic, but um, I, I, you know, I, I have a friend, for instance, who is kind of reading himself back into the church, and the answer is like, you got to paint or get off the ladder, man. Like we're all just a confession away from being righted with God when we're falling away from the church. But that's the way the truth in life. This is what God has given us, and you know, when our Lord came down, He He didn't promise our 72 or 73 books of the Bible, or 66, he promised a church. The, the Bible says that the church is the, the pillar and foundation of the truth. God knew that he was going to have to deal with 300 years before we had a Bible to, to let us know <laughs> what was going to guide us, what was going to make sure that we were staying in the fullness of the faith. And that's why he gave us the church. And so, yeah, it's hard sometimes to be a Catholic. This is really unfortunate from Pope Francis. And I'm not, I, I don't really get worked up over on my channel about, do you see what the Pope said here? I, especially this late in the game, guys, I'm just kind of sad, you know? I hope that these are just taken out of context and that we dream them up as trads, but it's just really unfortunate language. And I think a lot of Catholics who are plugged in understand that. Even Catholics that don't go to Latin Mass, even Catholics who wouldn't call themselves traditional, and it's just unfortunate that confusion is obviously been enthroned um, in the church. And we have an obligation to our children, to ourselves, to our spouses, to our families, to try to, to, to eradicate that confusion. Not with the sword, although sometimes that might be called upon us, but we must eradicate it with those, right? The rosary. We must eradicate it with prayer, um, with a life of staying in a state of grace. So uh, you should pray for Pope Francis because um, 
you know, he needs prayers too. And I think this is all just teaching us that we can love the Pope. We can, uh, we can pray for the Pope. We can support the Pope when he does good, but, uh, essentially that we don't allow for that misbehavior. We allow for charity, right? We take the widest path possible out of deference and obedience, but, but we don't succumb to it, right? Catholics, we're not, we're not a whiplash sort of people. Pope Francis said this, Pope Benedict said this, John Paul II said this, that's not how the church is supposed to be. And that is something that, that I think is being burnt away in real time. I'm sick of whiplash papacies. I just want a very steady Catholic religion. And it doesn't mean that every single thing that's ever been uttered by any Pope ever time in history is just automatically correct. You can't think anything else because there are degrees, right, of, of our ascent of truth. Um, but we, we need to stop kind of just defending every little thing the Pope says. And also it's probably good not to just kill Pope Francis over everything he says. This case, however, is dangerous, unfortunate, and as I think I do agree with Nick, proximate to heresy as far as I can understand and errors in theology. And I think it's just a tale of two churches. I talk about this on the show a lot. It's a tale of two churches. And um, you just kind of have, at this point have to pick your lane and really hope as a Catholic, you know, just be teaching the faith to your children and, you know, God's in command. That's a, that's a huge thing. And so again, it's glad trad podcast. So I do want to give that takeaway for this little topic. God is in control friends. Um, he will not see uh, the church fall into error and to ruin, but sometimes like every 500 years, the church has to really clean shop. This is one of those times. And so happy should we be to be in these evil times? Because if we can help uh, cooperate with God's grace in these times, then our children may live in good times. And uh, that's that. So do pay, pray for Pope Francis. I, I very much do. Uh, great. So about 15 more minutes and then I'll kind of stop the stream. But everyone's looking good. Amanda, thank you for that affirmation. Uh, don't forget, of course, to like the stream if you're watching. And if you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe. We very much appreciate that. And uh, before I leave Nick's stuff, I did see something funny. Uh, Nick did a video earlier today with Timothy Flanders. He's over at Crisis Magazine. Uh, is the Pope Catholic? Which is a funny little joke we used to laugh about as Catholics and now it's a genuine question. I did like your top comment on your Facebook, Nick. Are you Catholic? It's like, yes, Nick is very Catholic. Catholic AF, thank you very much. Probably more Catholic than I am. Certainly you have a better prayer life, brother, I'm sure. Um, but I talk louder, so it's okay, who cares? Uh, <laughs> totally just teasing. All right, moving on. This is something I really, really wanted to talk about. and. Um, I've not completed the entirety of the article, but I've completed enough of it to know that, that my people, uh, have definitely, uh, been rallied and that's great. So you're going to hear me talk about this a little bit more now that I can, but man, dude, Catholics are supposed to be the opposite of Puritans. And I think what you have to realize, especially as an American is we are a nation that is affected directly by the trajectory of the Puritans. So I would actually make an argument that Catholic, that the American culture has this pendulum and we have these times that are like really, really everything shut down, very anti-Catholic and times where it's just pure livaciousness and immorality. Again, all in relation really to our Puritan roots. So again, what are Puritans? We have to remember this. Puritans are not just those cool guys with the funny little hats. Puritans were Anglicans purifying the Church of England from its Catholicism. If you watch a great movie like Cromwell, um, you get to see that, right? Where um, where Cromwell is a, a hardcore Puritan, he later became, uh, oh, what was the term that he had? It was not the, I think Lord Protector, chat, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Cromwell, no, no, that was Thomas More's Lord Protector of England. Um, but that might've been Cromwell's as well, but he essentially was a dictator uh, for, for Britain and then did very mean things to the Irish and to Catholics. The point I'm trying to make here is that, uh, this country, you know, we always talk really rosy eyed, always oh, found because of religious liberty. Well, sure. But that religious liberty was Puritanism, which is by its inception, anti-Catholic. So the reason I bring this up is because occasionally in traditional Catholicism, as we try to make sense of the confusion and spin, I actually see tendencies that I would describe as puritanical. Um, and it's very strange because Catholics are supposed to be like, this is something I love about being a Catholic, okay? I love how the Catholic countries that are the hotspots of the faith are also the hotspot for art and fashion and culture. You think of Italy and you think of France, for instance. Um, these are supposed to be like the places where, uh, you know, Catholicism um, is difficult. 
or not difficult, I'm sorry, the place where Catholicism flourishes is also the place where Catholicism is needed the most. But again, I think it's great uh, that, uh, you know, you can have people who look very lovely. They, they can be very fashionable. They can build very beautiful things, have beautiful music, but it's not overboard. It's not like every night's carnival. And in fact, the Catholic Church is there to say that that it's okay to glorify the creation of mankind and it's okay to glorify God in very beautiful ways, but we shouldn't forget that we are people fundamentally not for this world, but we're supposed to be preparing for the next world. This is all a really long-winded way of saying that uh, Catholics, uh, Catholic ladies out there, your dresses at mass are great and you shouldn't change that and you should always wear nice colors. Uh, and guys, we should dress nice and it's cool to look fly uh, and we don't need to change that as long as it's all considered within modesty. Okay, so that is a great primer. There are some Catholics who don't think other Catholics should dance with the opposite sex. I'm just going to say it. I And I, I used to think this was a bit of a trad caricature, especially when I was new. I've now seen enough comments on this very topic, and I can understand it. Like, I can get, if you grew up like me, I was a, I was a public school kid, and all the homecoming and prom dances were grinding. You know, that was very big back then. And it was really unfortunate. In fact, I'll tell you guys a little story real quick. But um, when I was a junior in high school, I really started to get serious about my faith. And I thought I'd always been like, you know, I thought I was serious, but I just wanted to be better. And one of those things was I had this, this date, girl who I, I thought she was very, very beautiful. But uh, I should just explain myself before. I wasn't going to grind at prom. So I had a pretty disastrous junior prom because I wanted to be a good Christian boy. And for her, that felt like I was scorning her. And really... In retrospect, this would have been like a conversation. Hey, let's have a good time. But like, I'm not going to like, you're not my wife. And uh, if you were my wife, y'all wouldn't know about it because that kind of stuff should happen privately. Thank you very much. Uh, but uh, but that was unfortunate. But you kind of see like that was the mode when I was in public school. So I actually do think, yeah, that kind of dancing, obviously that's not what we're talking about. But yeah, there is an element of, uh, there can be an element of very deep sexual immorality in dancing. And uh, that's really unfortunate. So Moving on here, um, there are some Catholics who think that the opposite sex shouldn't shouldn't dance. Actually, I've I've had this been experienced directly. Um, even at my church, I feel like uh, I, I've encountered some Catholics. There's some schools of thought, right, that say that the reason why is because the virtue of dancing risks sexual impro uh, improper uh, behavior between the opposite sexes. And uh, maybe this is my least trad opinion, but it, I think it's a pretty deeply trad opinion, actually, because... Uh, looking at culture and at religion, there has been dancing for the last 2,000 years of the history of the faith, and there has been even dancing with uh, the other sex, and it's not all just wildly um, uh, sexualized. It doesn't have to be. And actually, that's dangerous, too. Like, we shouldn't have to sexualize the idea of dancing. There are some dances that you shouldn't do. There are, you know, definitely. Maybe some dances that are best kind of saved between married couples, maybe like a tango which uh, love the music of tango and I've never danced tango because uh, uh, you probably one you should probably dance with your wife. But um, I do love this article that was written. It's in Tradition and Sanity. I'll link it. Uh, Dr. Kwasaninski, uh, Dorothy Cummins McLean, and Julian Kwasaninski responding to the traditional arguments against dancing. So I'm just going to give the overview of the article. There are some really great things, um, but they're talking about, first off, there are some great Catholic colleges and events that have great dancing. Actually, I went to the um, internet, what is it? The ICI ball, which is the um, International Theological Institute. They're based out of Austria and they had their first ball here in Denver. They did it to kind of introduce the ICI to the community, ITI rather, to the community. And it was a ball. So I got decked out in coattails, right? And uh, I went dancing and it was a very, very wonderful event. And it was very Pride and prejudice because we were doing a lot of waltzing, but Vienna waltzing is very difficult. So, uh, but that was great. I think that that was a perfect example of what I wish my high school experiences had been like. And also I think what Catholic experiences should be like. So there are some churches around here that do swing dancing and waltzing and, and it's good because here's the reality, guys. And I think sometimes uh, the priests, um, not all priests, but I think sometimes you have to be a bit of a pragmatist. The church should encourage the healthy meeting of the sexes because this world is so ridiculous right now. In the old days, you were to have been in the same village as your wife or a village over, and the family would have been very much involved in family matters. But nowadays, most of us are can be far away from home, and our significant other is also far away from home. And so 
dating, dating, which is a relatively new concept in the history of the world, has only been around for a hundred years, all right, since the advent of the car, really, um, is very, very new. And um, it's it, it has made it so that the sexual ethics of things are very, very all over the place. There's a great book I'd recommend. It's called Plain Talks on Marriage from the 20s, and it's warning against the danger of parking, right, and going on rides with boys. And that's that's something that has to definitely be talked about. But dancing in and of itself can be a very wonderful thing. And churches, I think, should facilitate the healthy uh, interaction between the sexes because there's a vested interest. Most Catholicism comes from births, not conversion. And that's an awesome thing. It's a family religion. And also you have to think about the cultures, again, which Catholicism flourishes. Italians like to dance. The French like to dance. Uh, the, uh, the, the, um, I'm black, right? We certainly like to dance and you can have good, clean fun. And, uh, I love my buddy Nick here in the comment. I lean towards dancing me on the danger side, not in and of itself. I honestly think that Dr. K missed the mark to a degree. My right response. Oh, you totally would. You know what? <laughs> Actually, never mind. I have nothing really to say. Believe it or not, but Pope Benedict the 15th explicitly condemns priests promoting dancing any at all? Very interesting. Uh, well, I'll have to read that if you source it. He might have been wrong on that. I think priests should probably promote some form of interaction between the opposite sexes. And dancing doesn't have to be immodest. Like, ugh, these guys just need to go to a barn party sometime. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, I think it's a fun article. I think it's great. Um, I love that they included a lot of the, the pictures. There is something interesting in this. And I kind of made a, a joke earlier, but... My my Spotify is filled with a lot of 1920s jazz music. I, I love jazz. I was a jazz, am a jazz musician. Um, I know some people, uh, trads who kind of wag their tails at jazz and rock, or not wag their tails. That'd be like they're dancing, but they kind of wag their their finger at jazz and rock and roll and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, some of it's very bad and dangerous. And part of jazz in the early days is that they talked about the syncopation, this animalistic syncopation that was going to hype up your passions and make you immoral. Yeah, that can, that can happen with certain styles of jazz and certain genres of jazz. But what's funny also is 100 years later, and this is how you know the needles move maybe with morality. So maybe, maybe Nick, you have a point here. But like swing dancing, which when swing dancing was new and on the scene, it was like condemned a lot. There were a lot of places that were very, very careful about it. But now you go to like a, you go to a, a nice church and you go swing dancing and it's pretty tame. And if you watch a documentary like Ken Burns Jazz, you see that swing dancing actually did become very commercialized and swing became very commercialized and so much so that many jazz musicians said that swing wasn't jazz. So I'm not going to get into that debate, but I'm just trying to make a point that when I see swing dancing and Catholics, it doesn't strike me as particularly immorality. Oh dear, do we have a disagreement? <laughs> we never have a disagreement. The reason, all right, hang on, let me read you, Nick. Uh, I can cite, in the century just past, in the states of North America, the custom began whereby Catholic families would gather at dances. The reason justification for this was given that Catholics might get to know each other and be united more. So you just gotta, you know what? I can't even read this all, Nick. You're just gonna have to make a video. Just don't make it a response to me. Otherwise, we're gonna have a TNT falling out. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think it's a fun article. I think you should learn it. I do think I like kind of the different sections of it. Catholics must learn to dance. Yeah, we should. And we should bring back those kind of like old pride and prejudice dances. I want to learn how to waltz better, but I don't want to do Viennese waltzing. That's just way too much spinning for kind of a beginner like me. There is something really fundamentally beautiful about being a human, dancing with, with, with a pretty girl, and it being a relatively tame thing. I come from a Hispanic background. My family is all from Northern New Mexico. So I could tell you like dancing is a way of life. And actually something funny, um, my cousin got married to a great guy. His family is Baptist or comes from a Baptist more background. But what's interesting is that they don't dance at their weddings, which was weird. So we danced of course at the wedding, it was a Catholic wedding. And in my family, there's something called La Marcha, which is this kind of great wedding march and there's, there's a lot of imagery and symbolism inside that's very, very Christian. It's wonderful. But I can't imagine that very religious cultural thing being removed um, because of, because of um, you know, the fear of immorality. I mean, you don't just dance with the opposite sex. There are dances that you do with the boys, right? Uh, there are dances that you do with your family, for instance. Uh, heck, if I listen to music and do this, this might be dancing. So I'd say this, if you watch movies like, um, if you watch movies like uh, Footloose, the whole core of Footloose is that they prohibit dancing and they're kind of figuring out how to best make their argument. 
The funny thing about that movie is that I think it ends in the most reasonable sort of way. Like there's there's not really any serious conflict. They're just like, okay, well, you just better clean dance to be home by 10. Uh, so that's fine. Yo, totally fine that we have disagreements, by the way, chat. I see Amanda, you agree with Nick. That's fine. Nick, Nick's brilliant. So that's cool. But uh, Nick, you can sit there and not dance and uh, I'll go dancing and uh, then we can compare notes. Now I'm totally just playing. Uh, so I know I'm all over the place. This article is this article's long and that's why. Um, so I, I think that you guys should read it. In fact, I'll just kind of link it down below before I go uh, because it's pretty, pretty fun. It's a pretty good read. And I think we're kind of approaching the hour, guys. So I think I'm going to call it there. But hey, I'm so appreciative for everyone who has stuck around. Um, I want to read Nick. I want to read your last comment because I know that we have fun. I do not condemn all dancing for sure, but I also think that the prudence of the church is right. Plus, we are not even getting to the four types of touch in moral theology and the types of uh, delectation. Yeah, you're right. Like, <laughs> uh, you must forgive me. I, I've... Uh, church history is a little more my suit. I've I work for a graduate school of theology, and I've discovered that I would never be a very good theologian. Also, Nick, I'm sure you can agree with this. I don't think sanguines make for very good theologians. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're way too flighty for it. Uh, but sanguines know how to dance and how to have Catholic babies, so that's a good thing, right? Uh, I'm just totally playing. Hey, no, but seriously, I think I think this is probably a good a good place to end it. Oh, that's dirty dancing you're talking about, Diane. Oh Lord, that movie is trash. Can I just tell you that? That movie is trash. And you young ladies of the 80s should be very ashamed that you just wanted to see a, a sweaty Kevin Bacon, if I remember correctly. That is something you should go to confession about. So, uh, <laughs> hey, go on. And thank you guys all for uh, for joining into the stream. I think it was a very big success. We're going to do this every Friday. Nick, I would love for you to come on one of these Friday lives because it's always great to see how healthy the chat is. If you're new to the channel, please don't forget to subscribe. And also check out plenty of our content down below. There's a lot of great videos videos and topics indeed. Also, don't be afraid to check out Nick's channel, Absolutely Great The Traditional Thomist. That is like my go-to. So it's probably generally my most watched Catholic channel presently. So, um, and I, I don't mean that with any uh, kind of grandiose. Nick does really, really great work and he's a really good friend. Uh, so yeah, God bless you guys. And thank you all for tuning in. I'll see you on the next one, all right? Oh, before you go, of course, check out our Patreon and don't forget, of course, to like and to subscribe and to share the video too. I'm going to post these feeds up after we get done like this. So, you know, more stuff to come. All right, guys. God bless you. Bye-bye.